All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to this uh, Complexity Colloquium uh, organized in partnership with the Center for Complex System Studies here with that and the uh, Urban Future uh, series of lectures. Um, I'm actually very happy to see such a big, uh, a big crowd. We managed to fit everyone uh, in our in our very nice room, and I'm really happy to welcome Cesar Hidalgo. Uh, well, I don't think he needs any introduction given the number of people that are now attending. But Cesar Hidalgo is um, is an associate professor at the MIT Media Lab, and he's the director of the group uh, Collective Learning. And he's also uh, he's done really so many contributions that have inspired our work here in Utrecht uh, related to how complexity drives economic growth, why complex knowledge is uh, you know very concentrated in space, and basically how nations, countries, and organizations learn. So uh, he really gave us a lot of food for thought, and I think today uh, he has some uh, again new ideas that will be very very uh, well received here in this crowd. So Cesar, thank you so much for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Pierre. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to present some old work, some new work, and some applied work. Uh, my old work, I think, is going to be familiar to the people that are working here on economic geography, which is work on relatedness and complexity. From there, I'm going to go to more recent work that tries to understand what are the strategies that we should follow to try to engineer economic development based on this perspective. And after that, I'm going to show some of the applied work, because my work is not only academic, but I also do applied work in which we create tools to integrate, distribute, and visualize data at uh, the scale of uh, countries and large organizations. This is work that also I professionalized by creating a private sector company that now specializes on that. And I'm going to show you a little bit of where that work is headed to, you know, and uh, also how it makes us think about a future in which big data and AI are going to be more integral part of the way that we run governments. Okay? But the story doesn't start in the future, it doesn't start with AI and with big data. You know, it starts in a place that actually is, is much more common and simple, which is on the high Andes. You know, because there, a few years ago, uh, the acting president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, decided to create a city of science and technology. You know, uh, this city was called Yachay, that's the Quechua word for knowledge. You know, and the idea of Yachai was to create you know, a city that would compete with like Silicon Valley and Shenzhen and would generate science and technology you know, at a global competitive level. So they designed uh, the city based on a $1 billion budget. They put that billion dollar aside, that's a lot of money, like the, the GDP of a country like Ecuador is like a hundred billion, so you get an idea that it's 1% of GDP that is going into this place. And they decided to create this city two hours north of Quito. Okay? So this was a uh, former agricultural land that now you know, they were transforming into this city of science and technology. So there was a lot of enthusiasm. There were professors actually from many U.S. universities that were very enthusiastic about the idea. You know, professors in Caltech, the president of Paraguay you know, uh, gave praise to this program uh, in, in a Latin American conference of presidents. You know. But a few years later, even though the <coughs> plan was grandiose, the vision you know, that was executed was much more modest, yeah? So, and you kind of start imagining why, because a billion dollars, even if you think about it, it sounds like a lot of money, but if you look out the window, I'm guaranteeing that the buildings that you see here, building them again would cost over a billion, you know, just the buildings that you see out there. A billion is not that much money when it comes to construction, and when you're bringing every brick, every worker, <coughs> and every piece of steel, you know, two hours north of Quito, you get even less, okay? So it becomes like a really expensive project, and at the end, what they ended up is with a modest set of construction, many of which are still unfinished, you know, and a group of students, you know, that now are subsidized to go to this university that is not a university of research anymore, but it became more of an educational university. The university has gone now uh, in this short life through six presidents, okay? So the plan, you know, was very grand, but eventually the implementation didn't fulfill that plan. And this is not the only place where these type of ideas you know, have happened in a similar way and they have not come to the fruition that the visions expected. This is a skull Kogbotek. It's you know, like an hour and a half in public transportation from downtown Moscow. It was also the idea of creating like a big city of science and technology. In this case, I would argue, much better located because it was close to Moscow, which is more central in the global network of knowledge flows than, than two hours north of Quito. You know? 
uh, here is the Master Institute of Technology in Abu Dhabi. It was also like a big effort done in collaboration with MIT. They put lots of money, they put billions of dollars in the creation of this institute. The institute now folded, uh, became part of Khalifa University. You know, it's actually in, in, in financial problems and everything. But they did do a lot of architecture, if you think about it, you know? <laughs> and the most spectacular example of this white elephant type of projects that I would say is this one. So this one is uh, the Center for Research on uh, Petroleum and Gas in Saudi Arabia. It's a building designed by Seda Hadid. You probably can see that from the, from the type of structure. And I would argue that the building is gorgeous, okay? It's a beautiful building, you know? It's very intricate, you know? What's inside, what's outside, it blends beautifully, you know, in this construction, you know? Uh, and of course, this is not a cheap building, you know? This is a very expensive building to build. You know? And the problem with all of these projects is that at the end of the day, buildings don't produce knowledge. So all of these are efforts to try to produce knowledge, to create science, technology, innovation, you know? but at the, end up, at the end of the day, they end up being architectural efforts, you know? in which like, big constructions are being made, but what matters more than the building is the people that goes in it, and if all of the money goes into the building, you know, well, not necessarily you're going to be able to produce a lot of science, technology, and research. You know? Uh, so what I'm going to say is that in some way we're making many of these mistakes because we fail to understand that the creation, diffusion and valuation of knowledge is not something that is haphazard and that you can engineer anywhere. It's also something that satisfies some natural laws, like the loss of diffusion in the case of heat, the loss of knowledge also determines how knowledge is created, how it is valued, how it diffuses, what is the conductivity and resistivity of different channels for that diffusion, and if you understand those laws, you might think about this type of projects differently. Okay? So what I'm going to do in the first part of the presentation, I'm going to tell you that there are three laws that govern you know, the derivative of knowledge. The derivative of knowledge is learning. You know? And the first one is the principle of experience, which helps us understand at which rates we can accumulate knowledge as we practice things. The second one is the principle of diffusion, which helps us understand how knowledge moves from one part of the world to another, from one organization to another, from one industry to another. And the third one is the principle of intensity, which helps understand how much we value knowledge. You know, what's the value of knowledge concentrations? Now, these principles are not all of my creation. In fact, they respond to a long literature of people that have been studying the accumulation of knowledge for a long time. So the first principle of experience goes back to the 1910s. At that time, there was an electrical engineer that turned into a psychologist during his PhD, and his name was Leon Thurston. And Thurston had the vision that he could measure learning quantitatively you know, if he would take data from a typing class at the Duff Business School in Pittsburgh. Okay? So during his PhD, he went to Pittsburgh, you know, and he was uh, part of this typing class. At that time, you know, typing was a really modern technology. This is 1916 when this experiment was conducted. And these students had to uh, take this typing class in which there was a four-minute exam every week. So he could measure you know, how many errors each one of them made, how many pages they were able to type as they practiced. And what he discovered is that across all of these students there was a law that was governing their learning of typing. You know? And he basically claimed that there was sort of like this learning curve. A learning curve is something that now is part of our everyday language, but at that time it was not. You know? Thurston was one of the people that introduced it into our vocabulary and was the first one to really document it and was part of his PhD thesis. So we started to figure out that actually learning, you know, responded to some sort of laws in which at the beginning you get a lot of learning, you know, with a little bit of practice, but the more you practice, the less learning that you get per unit of practice. There's like these diminishing returns and at the end, you know, no matter how much you practice, you know, there's going to be a maximum level of proficiency that you're going to achieve. Now, Thurston was looking at learning at the individual level. These were people learning how to type in a business school. You know? But this idea was eventually extended to other domains. In the 1930s, uh, Theodore Wright, who was <coughs> an aeronautics engineer, took this idea into the realm of manufacturing. So at that time, the US was building a lot of um, airplanes you know, in preparation for the Second World War. You know? And these airplanes were being built by the same team of people using the same equipment you know, and it was the same airplane being done with the same facilities and so forth. And what Thurston did was measure the time that it took a team to build an airplane. You know, uh, and by doing that, 
he was able to show that this was not an economy of scale, this was not an economy of scope, this were not changes in technology because the tools were the same, the team was the same, the scale was the same, you know, something must have changed inside the team, you know, and that change inside the team must be some sort of learning or knowledge that was being accumulated. So he was able to show that there was learning also at this team scale. It was not just that individuals learn how to type, also teams learn as they perform a task over and over again. And basically this idea of learning started to grow, you know, uh, and the most famous example is when actually learning starts to be observed not at the level of individuals or teams, but at the level of industry. <coughs> and this is the Noyce and Moore law, you know. Then the Noyce and Moore law tells us that we double the amount of transistors that we are able to pack in a unit of volume about every two years, okay. And in this case, it's not the same company that is doing the breakthroughs all the time. You know, there are different companies that are doing the breakthroughs. So the industry is the one that learning and this is sustaining this learning rate, which in this case, you know, is an exponential learning, you know, at least as measured in the density of these chips. So I'm going to say that there's a first law, you know, which is this principle of experience. We can call it the Thurston, Wright, and Moore law. And it tells you that the unit cost of performing an economic activity decreases with cumulative experience. So the more you practice, you know, the better you become at something, but also <coughs> the more you practice, the less learning that you get per unit of practice, you know. Now, uh, if you want to measure this precisely, there's a, a wonderful book by Linda Argot from CMU that looks a lot at these learning curves, you know, and there you want to also discount, you know, the uh, production that you've done based on how long ago you did it. So the most recent unit of practice is more valuable than, you know, uh, some practice that you did many, many years ago because you also have forgetting, you know, in these type of systems. But while scholars were studying learning curves, you know, there were other group of people that were using learning curves. And these were manufacturers. And one of those manufacturers was Henry Ford. Okay? So these are learning curves, you know, that, learning, uh, that, that Henry Ford wrote, you know, uh, during the production of the Model T first. So here is, you know, the learning curve of the Model T production between 1908 and 1926. So this is almost a 20-year learning curve in which the cost of the Model T decreases over time as Ford starts doing vertical integration and figuring out ways to make the same car, you know, cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Okay? So he writes this learning curve, you know, like Thurston does his experiment around here, if you think about it. So like, you know, in the private sector, they were a little bit ahead of academia at that time, maybe. You know? <laughs> Uh, but at some point, he has to stop. Because what happens is that, well, he was getting better at doing the same thing over and over and over again. But by 1926, there were many other competitors in the auto industry, and people didn't want to buy a Model T anymore, no matter how cheap it was. Okay? Because there were other cars that were faster, they were more comfortable. So in some sense, you know, riding the learning curve was no longer a viable business strategy for Ford. And they have to change to other models, and the Model A, and they have to start coming up with models that are more luxurious, or you know, faster or more comfortable, that can carry more cargo. And then, basically what happens is that their costs start climbing up, because as you change activities, you in some way cannot transfer all of the learning that you accumulated in the previous activity to the new one. You know? So if we think about this loss of learning, this first law tells us how much we improve as we practice something. But in reality, we don't only need to learn how to do the same thing better. We need to learn how to do different things. You know? So we need other laws that can help us understand what's the rate at which we can enter new activities. Okay? And economies need to learn lots of things. We learn new products, new research areas, new occupations, new industries, new skills, and so forth. Now, is that learning a collective phenomena or is learning an individual phenomena? And there's a simple way to try to separate between these two hypotheses. You know? So imagine for a second that we're going to use an example of individual learning. So you guys want to learn how to play the piano. And in one world, you are in a city in which there's a lot of musicians, a lot of people that know how to play the piano. You know? And in another world, you are alone in the top of a mountain with a piano you know, by yourself. Okay? You know? so, if it doesn't matter if you are in one world or the other, you are going to be on this side. Because the probability that you will learn something doesn't depend on how many neighbors know how to do that thing. Okay? You know, it's just individual learning, so it's just up to you and to practice. And if you have a lot of neighbors, like here, or you have no neighbors that know that thing, well, your probability of learning or entering or becoming good at that activity is the same. 
But if learning is a collective phenomenon, what you're going to find is that, well, the probability that you would enter that activity or that you become good at it should increase with the number of neighbors that have knowledge on that activity. Okay? So in that world, you know, if you're in a city full of musicians, you're more likely to become a good musician than if you are trying to learn everything by yourself. You know? Of course, you can separate you know, between different <coughs> regimes. You know? uh, a priori here, uh, we still don't know if the neighbors reinforce each other and they're increasing returns. You know, if the neighbors provide redundant information, so therefore they're decreasing returns. Or if each neighbor basically adds the same amount of learning you know, than the previous one. Now, who the heck are these neighbors? Okay? And here we need to separate between two things. There are two types of neighbors. The first type of neighbors is the traditional neighbor, like those that live next to you. Okay? So these are the geographic neighbors, the cultural neighbors, the social neighbors. Okay? So a neighbor of Utrecht would be Amsterdam, you know? yeah? and it would be a neighbor in geography, but it also would be a neighbor in language, you know? it might be a neighbor on colonial history and past, and so forth. You know? uh, but there are also like, neighbors that can be social. It could be your social relationships and so forth. You know? uh, it could be people that, that you share a history as well. But there are also other types of neighbors which are cognitive neighbors. Okay? These are neighbors between activities that might require the same knowledge to be produced. You know? So for instance, manufacturing motorcycles might be a cognitive neighbor of manufacturing cars, but might not be a cognitive neighbor of a hospital. Yeah? Because these would be more dissimilar activities. So you have neighbors in some sense in space, a space being very general, being a space that is both physical and human, and there is also neighbors in another space that is cognitive, which is you know, how related these activities are. When it comes to the first part, like these geographic neighbors, you know, we have good evidence you know, that tells us that actually knowledge diffuses in a way that is quite geographic. The seminal paper here in this literature is the Jaffe, Trattenberg, and Henderson paper from QJE in 1993. And what they do is they match patents, you know, basically they find patents that were about the same technology file at the same time, but in different parts of the world, you know, and for every patent, they look at a twin, you know, and they try to see, well, are patents more likely to be cited by other patents that occur in the same MSA, in the same city, in the same state, you know, than patents that are their twins and that produce elsewhere. <coughs> and what they find is, yes, that there is an enrichment. So, like, if you count <coughs> even excluding, you know, self-citations, uh, patents receive about four citations from, you know, four percent of the citations from patents that are in the same location compared to their twins who receive about one percent. So there's like a four times increase, four times more, you know, citations that are from local origins that in some way could not be explained, you know, simply by the technology class or the time in which this patent was filed. But then, you know, eventually people started to dig deeper into this because it couldn't be that geography per se, you know, was the one that was limiting the diffusion of knowledge. You know, it's not that knowledge has a problem, you know, traversing mountains or going through oceans. You know, it must be that a space in some sense containing something else that is limiting the diffusion of knowledge. So then people like uh, Stefano Brecci, Francisco Rizzoni, or Singh at INSEAD started to look at the networks of the inventors. Yeah? Who had they co collaborated with? And they realized that a lot of this geographic diffusion of knowledge was explained you know, by the networks of the event. Okay? So the reason why knowledge didn't diffuse far in space was because the social networks that we create are circumscribed. So if you are doing research here and you write a paper in Utrecht, you know, it's more likely to get cited by other scholars in Utrecht you know, because they're more likely to know about your work and they're more likely to know about your work because your social networks, your paths, are relatively short. Yeah? They might know you, they might know someone that knows you and so forth, and that you know, localization of social networks is the one that contains, in big part, the diffusion of knowledge. In this case, knowledge defined in a very loose and simple way is simply just citing someone else's paper. It's not even knowing how to do something, it's knowing about something. Yeah? And we know now that all of these proximities matter, you know, so uh, geography you know, matters, of course social networks matter, and that's one of the big reasons why geography matters. Sharing borders between countries matters, so knowledge diffusion is more likely if you share a border, if you share a language, if you share colonial history, and so forth. You know? In fact, we have been looking a little bit at this ourselves, you know, using data that can help us understand what happens when a geography changes, when things become close to each other. How do you make two cities close to each other? How do you bring two cities close to each other? You build a train, exactly. You know, so uh, here 
you know, you have an example that we did in China. So in China, we looked at data from all of the provinces in China. We looked at the industries that were present in each one of these provinces. We have a similar paper now with data from Sweden, you know, and what we try to see is what happens to the productivity and the industrial composition of cities as high-speed rail is created between them, okay? And like what we find in both cases is kind of interesting is, you know, as you build a train between, you know, a, a pair of cities, the cities, instead of differentiating, they become more similar in terms of the activities that are present in both of them. And that's interesting because if you look at a Ricardian type of trade theory, it would tell you that, well, if you have two cities that now can interact more, they should differentiate and specialize in different things because it's not good for them to be doing the same thing. But what we find is kind of the opposite, is that cities become more similar as they become connected, which would be evidence of like knowledge diffusion and learning. The other aspect that tells us that there might be learning going on here, you know, is that when you look at a pair of cities that are connected by train, you can look at industries that were present in both of them or just one of them. And the industries that are present in both cities experience higher increases in productivity than the industries that were present in one city and not the other. So if this was a story about the train increasing productivity of everyone, well, it shouldn't matter if the city is present on one of the cities that receive the train or in both. But if in addition to having a boost of productivity coming from the train, you have some sort of learning, well, the learning can only be enjoyed by the industries that are shared by both cities, not the ones that are present in one and not the other. Because the ones that are present in one and not the other have nobody to learn from. Yeah? The ones that are present in both. And that's what we find. We find kind of like on a diff in diff, about 98,000 yuan more, that's like $15,000 more of uh, output per worker, increasing productivity, when the cities were connected by train. You know, also, if you have productive neighbors, you know, you build like a density type of indicator based on that, you know, you actually observe higher productivity. We also have been looking not only at the role of technology and knowledge diffusion, we have been, uh, sorry, of uh, transportation knowledge diffusion, but also at the, at the role of technology. You know? And to do that, we have been using historical data. We've created a couple of versions of a project called Pantheon that grabs uh, historical data from Wikipedia, from hundreds of language editions, to try to understand you know, which are the cultural products that each country exports. So you can think that if you look at traditional international trade data, you would say that Brazil exports iron ore, airplanes, and soybeans. But if you look at Pantheon, you would see that they export soccer players, politicians, and musicians, and so forth. Okay? And when we look at this data, you know, we find a couple of interesting things. First, you know, we can look at the rate at which the world was producing people that we still remember prominently today as a function of time. Okay? So here you have like the number of globally famous people born in a year, you know, divided by the population of the world at that time, with a sliding time window. Okay? And here we go from the ancient Greeks all the way to the time where the printing press introduced. And finally enough, that rate is constant, statistically constant throughout all of that time. Okay? So you can think of this as the probability that your son would grow up to be like Leonardo da Vinci or something like that. You know? And that probability was relatively low. And after the printing print test invented, it suffers like a big jump. You know? And there's like this discontinuity that you can detect using change point analysis. You know? You know? So we wanted to kind of like study, like if that discontinuity was just a blip, it was something that we could attribute you know, technically to uh, the introduction of the printing press or not. Because what we observe on the one hand is the change in rate, and on the other hand we observe the change in composition. If you look at the composition of the biographies on this period, there were political leaders, religious leaders, some writers, some philosophers, very few scientists, very few artists. If you look at the second period, <coughs> there's lots of painters, composers, mathematicians, astronomers. There's a change also in the composition, you know, of the type of people that become famous <coughs> after the introduction of printing. So what we do here, is we use the fact that printing is a technology that had a very, very clear, you know, place and time of birth, you know, and that's the city of Frankfurt Mines. So we can use the distance between a city and mines as an instrumental variable to causally test if it is printing or something else, you know, what actually created this change in the type of globally famous people that these cities were producing. Why? Because, well, the probability that a city would produce a famous scientist or artist depends on lots of things, yeah? Can depend on how big the city is, can depend on how rich the city is, you know, can depend maybe on the history of that city and so forth. But all of those things, you know, are uncorrelated with, well, the distance to mines, because if you are a little shit city that is 
close to mines, you know, you are lucky that you're going to be able to adopt printing much sooner than if you're a little shit city that you're far from mines. Okay? You know? So, mines is an exogenous shock to the system. You know? If you're close to it, you're lucky you can adopt printing sooner. If you're far from it, printing is going to be adopted later. Okay? So, well, you can be a big city like Paris, you know, but Paris is closer to mine than Moscow. Yeah? Which is another big city. So, in some sense, this form of exogenous variation allows us to create an IV and trace causality. And what we find is the following, is that, you know, of course, if you look at the distance to mine, that predicts the year of a first printer. But when we use that IV treatment, what we find is that that IV predicts the year that a city will produce its first famous scientist, its first famous artist, but not its first famous politician, which is exactly what we expected. Because politicians were already famous in the oral era before printing. You know, scientists and artists were not, okay? This is also only predicted after, you know, the introduction of printing. So if you do the same analysis for the hundred years before printing, there was nothing special about being close to mines. And after printing, all of a sudden, there's something special about being close to mines, you know? So this is like causal evidence that actually, you know, uh, this change in technology changed the type of people that became famous, you know, in each one of these places and that we still remember today. Of course, there's a long literature of that, to, we can talk about that later. Now, let's go to the other neighbors. And these are the cognitive neighbors. So, we spent some time looking at the neighbors in geography or the neighbors, you know, in other dimensions in, in the social space, but you can also have neighbors in cognitive space. So, in this network, each node represents a product and uh, they are connected if they are related. How do we know that products are related? Well, in this case, we look at the probability that they're co exported. Okay? So, if fish tend to be exported, to, by the same countries that export frozen fish and preserved fish, we're going to say that these products are related. You know? And this helps us create a map of which are the neighbors in this cognitive space. You know? Now, the painted products here are the ones that Chile exported in 1979, so this also allows us to see which are the products that a country produced and which are the neighbors of those products in this cognitive space. So we can go from here and look at other examples because you know, uh, there's actually many people that have mapped similar spaces using different data, different techniques, but the story has something in common, and that's the part that I find interesting. So, um, uh, already almost, you know, like seven <coughs> years ago now, like Frank Nechpe, Martin Henning, and Ron Boschma, you know, created this industry space here, they're looking at industries, and they're connected industries if they manufacture products in the same plants, you know, and that's how they connected, you know, industries in this case. So, it's also a space of relatedness, Different data, different technique, but also you observe clusters of related activities. You observe these cognitive neighbors. Here you have a research space. Here each node represents an area of research, like basically like an area in which a journal is classified. When you publish a paper, you know journals belong to a certain class, so it's going to be a paper on organic chemistry, okay? Or it's going to be a paper on you know a molecular biology, or it's going to be a paper on economic geography. And each one of these nodes represents one of those areas. And links connect areas based on the probability that an author that published in this area also published in that area. Okay? So the people that publish in math also publish in statistics, those two areas are more likely to be connected. Okay? And you're still kind of like a, like a space that is a little bit of a ring. You know? So here you have uh, medicine, here you have brain and cognitive science, here you have economics, here you have computer science, which is like a very weak link here, and then from computer science you go to physics, to engineering, and to biology, and from biology you go to medicine, to the brain, to social sciences, and so forth. You know? That's how that space is structured. Uh, and this also applies to technology. Here you have this technology space by Boschma, Baland, and Kegler. So here each node is a technology class, and technology class are connected if they tend to be um, cited, pardon, if they tend to occur in the same patterns. So patterns make claims over technologies, you know, and if these technologies tend to co-occur in the same patterns, they're connected. Here you also observe well-defined clusters. Now, the prediction that we have been doing so far is that knowledge diffuses slowly. And this is true for geographic space, but it's also true for cognitive space. Okay? So the prediction would be that, well, if I know the activities that a location is present in, I should be able to predict the locations that are more likely to enter because they're going to be their neighbors. Okay? So I know that mines have printing, you know, I'm going to be able to predict that Frankfurt is more likely to get printing, you know, sooner than Rome. 
Yeah, because it's a neighbor in that case on geographic space. By the same token, I know if Chile is exporting frozen fish, it's more likely to start exporting fresh fish than to start exporting spark plugs. Okay? So here I have the practice factor of Chile in 1979 and 1996. And if we look at the activities that change, the products that Chile entered, you're going to see that most of these activities that Chile enters are activities that are nearby the previous activities in this space of cognitively related activities. So we're going to say here that there's a second principle, you know, and we call this the principle of relatedness. And this tells us that the probability of entering or exiting an economic activity increases with the number of related activities that are present in a location. And we know that this is true for countries and products, but it's also true for research areas, for individuals, universities, and countries. It's true for patents and cities. It's true for industries and cities and regions. It's true in Brazil. It's true in Sweden. It's true in China. It's true if we use data on the stock exchange core from the web, or if we use detailed administrative records for the entire population of a country based on pension fund systems. You know? So it's a very robust finding. You know? So we're going to say that there's kind of like a principle, and that this principle can be wrapped in a second law, which is this law of diffusion that includes two parts. You know? This law tells us that the probability of entering or exiting an activity, whether it is a product, an industry, a research area, etc., increases with the presence of related activities. It usually does so as a power, you know? And usually that alpha is a little bit larger than one, so it has to be increasing returns. And that these knowledge flows are more effective among geographic, demographic, cultural, and social neighbors. That's the first part, the first type of neighbors, but also among cognitive neighbors, okay? So it has like these two prongs, these two sub-principles. And this is something that is very robust. Here's like a small summary that we do with Peer. It's incomplete, you know, we know that. But it helps us show that, well, for different activities and for different spatial scales and organizational scales, there is already evidence of the literature of this principle at play. Okay? So it's a quite robust, you know, principle. It's not a law in the sense of uh, natural sciences as something that cannot be broken. Like the law of gravity is always going to be there. But it's a law in the statistical sense that is kind of like a very good educated guess of what's going to happen, you know, which is robust, you know, for a large number of spatial scales and a large number of different type of activities. Okay? Now, let's go now to the third principle, which is that of the law of knowledge <coughs> intensity. Okay? And what we're going to try to do here is instead of measuring knowledge based on relatedness, we're going to try to measure the total knowledge that takes place in a location. Because relatedness is a trick to measure knowledge, you know, if you think about it. You know? Why? Because, well, the way that knowledge works is that it has many properties. You know, it's non-rival, you know, and one of the properties that it has is that also it is relational. You cannot have knowledge. You can only have knowledge about something, okay? Knowledge is relational. So you have knowledge about, you know, frozen fish, or you have knowledge about manufacturing cars, okay? So relatedness is a way to say, hey, how much knowledge do you have for the activities that you are not yet in? Well, let's see the activities that you're in, how related they are to that, and that gives us a measure of how transferable that knowledge is, so I can measure how much you know about the things that you don't know by seeing how related that is to the things that you do know. Okay? So you respect the related nature of knowledge to measure knowledge specific to an activity. What we're going to try to do here is a little bit different. We're going to try to measure like, the total knowledge of a city. How much knowledge that, like, let's say, Amsterdam has vis-a-vis -vis Paris or vis-a-vis -vis Utrecht or vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, Tokyo or Shenzhen, you know? And to do that, we have to understand other properties of knowledge. And the first thing is that, well, one way that knowledge is not is like this, okay? So knowledge is not an extensive variable, okay? So let's say I say that Pierre has knowledge and I say that Andrea has knowledge, okay? So Pierre has knowledge, Andrea has knowledge. Now. If I put them together, do I have like two knowledges? You know, that would be kind of like a bit of a naive way of trying to measure knowledge, you know? Because maybe some of the things that they know, you know, same. are the same, it's redundant. Some of the things that they know are complementary, so they add up to something better. And some of the things that they know completely don't paste and don't work together, you know? So if we're going to measure knowledge, we have to consider that, well, knowledge is partly context specific, that has this relatedness nature, you know? Uh, it's also partly redundant, it's partly specific, and so forth. And that is one of the things that makes knowledge hard to measure. And there's a lot of people that have tried to measure knowledge, okay? And there was a big literature, especially in the 90s, about the knowledge economics, you know, that tried to kind of like understand, you know, knowledge from an empirical perspective. But the way that they did this empirically had some limitations. Because what they said is that economists have knowledge, and knowledge was expressed in activities, 
And I have no problem with that. But what happened then is that when push came to shove, and you had to create a quantitative indicator of the knowledge of allocation or something like that, what you would do is classify some activities as knowledge intense, and some activities are not knowledge intense. So you want to say, you know, doctors and computer scientists, they're very <coughs> knowledge intense, they're doing difficult stuff. Garbage collection, you know, people, not knowledge intense. So therefore, we're going to count the number of, you know, doctors and computer scientists that you have in your economy as a measure of his knowledge intensity. And, of course, the garbage collection guys don't contribute to that knowledge intensity. And if that's the best thing that you have, that's actually not bad, you know? But at the same time as a scientist, it leaves you with a bit of kind of like a bad taste because you sort of assumed the answer. You didn't discover the answer, you assumed it. So if I would classify garbage collection workers as knowledge intense and doctors as not knowledge intense, I would get the opposite result. Yeah? It's whatever I assume, it's whatever I get out. So I'm not discovering anything, I'm just getting out what I'm putting in. So there must be a better way. Another way is to say, well, economists have knowledge, okay, so far so good. Knowledge gets expressed in activities, but a priori, we don't know which activities are knowledge intense or not, okay? So what we're going to say is that these knowledge intense economies are those that are performing knowledge intense activities. So I'm going to say, is some sort of knowledge intense? I don't know. Do they do knowledge intense things? Well, what are knowledge intense things? Well, knowledge intense things are those that are done by knowledge intense economies. <laughs> no? So, well, is that thing that Amsterdam is doing knowledge intense? I don't know, it's Amsterdam knowledge intense. You know? So this is a circular argument. Yeah? <coughs> I'm saying the place is knowledge intensive if the activities that it's doing is knowledge intensive. The activity is knowledge intensive if it's being done by knowledge intensive locations. So let's translate this to math to try to kind of like go through the circularity of the argument. Okay? So I'm going to say that the knowledge K of CTC is equal to the sum of the knowledge K of the activities P present in that city. And this matrix MCP tells me that activity P is present in CTC. Okay? Now say the knowledge K of activity P is equal to the sum of the knowledge of the places where that activity is present. Okay? These are two very simple sums. I put the second one in the first one and I will get KC is equal to matrix times KC. So I have an eigenvector <coughs> code. This is kind of like a type of principal component analysis you know, method in which KC now is the principal component of this MCP matrix, you know, and would be a measure of the knowledge intensity of locations. I could do it also for activities that doesn't make any assumption about the things. Now, the problem with this formulation is that, well, I'm adding the knowledges. I'm saying like, Pierre has knowledge, Andreas has have knowledge. I have two knowledges when I put them both of them together. So another way of thinking about it is like, well, the knowledge of location C is equal to the average knowledge of the activities, okay? So this activity only adds to your knowledge intensity if it's above average, and it reduces your knowledge intensity is below average. So, hey, Amsterdam, let's say, you know, has robotics, okay, that adds to knowledge intensity, but also, I don't know, has some community gardens, well, that doesn't add to the knowledge intensity, okay? You know, the same for the activity, you know, if it occurs on places that are on average, you know, like knowledge intensity. And if you do that, the same story, more complicated matrix in between. How do these two metrics relate to each other? This is if we use like the extensive metric. This is we use the intensive metric. The intensive metric is the economic complexity index. Okay? So you do the extensive metric and the intensive metric, you see some differences. For example, Japan, you know, does much better in the economic complexity index, Singapore, Sweden, Finland. If you do the extensive metric, you get Germany, France, Italy, Poland, Spain, China. So this one is more biased towards big countries. And here you get a lot of little countries like Finland and Switzerland and Singapore that do quite well, you know? Because in fact, when I do only the extensive metric, I don't do anything much different than calculating the diversity of a country, simply counting the number of products that it exports. But when I do the intensive metric, basically I take this measure of diversity, am I correcting it for the sophistication of the activities? So that's why Singapore can do so well, that's why Japan can do so well, you know? And also, Spain, even though it's a country that exports a large variety of products, get Spanish because the products that it exports are not that sophisticated. Yeah? And when I use this intensive metric, the economic complexity index, I get a bunch of things because I have a measure of knowledge. But one thing is to have a measure of knowledge, another thing is that that measure of knowledge works. And that measure of knowledge works for a number of reasons. First, you know, it helps us explain a lot of variation in wealth. Okay? So more knowledge-intense economies are richer. Not knowledge-intense economies are poorer. 
but also help us explain variations in the change in wealth, in growth. So economies, let's say, like India and China, that here in 1985, they had already quite a knowledge-intense economy, you know, should grow faster than similarly knowledge-intense economies you know, that were richer. You know, because basically, if I'm able to do your job at one-tenth of the price, my salary on equilibrium should be one going up, not yours. Okay? <laughs> there, there must be a little bit of equilibrium going on sometimes. Okay? You know? And that's what you find. We can actually predict future economic growth based on the knowledge per unit of GDP that you have, as we can measure it here. You know? So you measure knowledge intensity, you measure GDP, and this is a super robust finding. So you can control for all of the institutional measures of the World Bank, and this kicks the ass of all of them. You can measure for all of the stuff of education. You can also do that. You can get all of the World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Index, and you beat all of them. Does that mean that education doesn't matter? Does that mean that institutions don't matter? No. What it tells us is that, well, like what we're doing here is using uh, like some sort of genetic approach to understand you know, the knowledge that exists in an economy. And I say genetic approach because instead of kind of looking at a country and trying to find one or two or three indicators or try to construct a survey, what we're doing is looking at the expression of that knowledge over a set of more than a thousand products in many cases. Okay? So we're saying kind of like which genes are on or off. You know? the, each product is kind of like a gene that is on or off and the knowledge is the one that is determining what gets turned on or off. <coughs> and in some way that's a better measure of the knowledge that you have than measures of education. Because how do I know that Japan you know, is good at mechanical engineering? Is it because all of you guys have intimate knowledge of the quality of the mechanical engineering program of Tokyo and Kyoto universities? Of course not. You know? Is it because you know that, well, they have Toyota and Mitsubishi and Kawasaki and all of those firms that are intense you know, in mechanical engineering knowledge? to the point that they export you know, to the world and they express that knowledge to those exports. So it's not that education doesn't matter, it's that your knowledge gets better expressed in the things that you're able to do you know, than you know, in formal measures of schooling. Okay? The same is true for your institutions. You, know? you have institutions, you know, those institutions are going to affect industries differentially. There are some industries that are very sensitive to corruption. There are some industries that require very reliable, let's say, logistics and customs. There are industries that are sensitive to different combinations of institutions. So if you have some institutions that fail, well, the industries that require those institutions are not going to be present. And therefore, by knowing the activities that a country is exporting, you're going to have some knowledge also, you know, indirectly of the institutions that are working and the ones that are not working. You know? The next bonus that we get is that this not only help us understand wealth and growth, but it also helps us explain a great deal of variation in income inequality. In fact, much more than the Kuznets curve. You know? So here you have the knowledge intensity of an economy, here you have Guinea, you know? and you see that there's a very strong negative correlation. This correlation is true for the 60s, for the 70s, for the 80s, for the 90s. You know? You know? It actually explains a great deal of the virus. We have an R-square of like 70% here, which is really high. You know? uh, and actually, economic complexity explains much more variation in inequality than the Kuznets curve. You guys are familiar with the Kuznets curve? This is the idea that inequality goes up and then down you know, as a country develops. Yeah? Well, that is a curve that appears because countries that have, you know, in some sense, intermediate level of development, sometimes they're extractive economies with huge inequality, and sometimes they're developing economies that have strong manufacturing sectors that are growing. When you use economic complexity to measure development instead of GDP per capita, you separate between those. So the extractive economies fall to the left, the more manufacturing economies fall to the right, and the Kuznets curves disappear, and things start to align. You know? So here we use Chile and Malaysia as an example because these are two countries with the same GDP per capita, with the same uh, <coughs> uh, years of schooling, you know? but with very different productive structure. Chile is an extractive economy, Malaysia is a more manufacturing economy, and this difference in practice structure explains a lot of that variation in inequality. What this tells us too is that inequality is not only a policy issue. It's really hard to be highly unequal with the industrial structure of Switzerland or Sweden. And it's really hard to have very small guineas if you have the practice structure of Angola or Peru. You know, in some sense, the mix of activities that you're involved in determines you know, the range of inequalities that you get to experience. 
You know, even countries like the U.S., you know, which are notorious for being highly unequal, you know, for a high level of development, in this regression in terms of income inequality, they are not outliers because, of course, the U.S. is unequal when you compare it with Denmark, but not when you compare it with Peru or Brazil, you know, or Malawi. So we have this third law, which is this law of knowledge intensity, and tells us to understand how we value knowledge. Okay, so knowledge intense economies and knowledge intense activities are associated with higher levels of income and more inclusive institutions. Now, this inequality relationship, we know it's true at the international scale, at the subnational scale, we have, you know, with Pierre been exploring that idea, we believe that is the opposite, you know, that more complex cities have higher levels of inequality, but also within country economies are very different than international economies, because within countries you have a special equilibrium. So New York is a city with a lot of inequality, but not everybody in New York was born in New York. New York has the ability to import a lot of poverty from Ohio and from West Virginia and from other places. So a lot of that inequality may come from that special equilibrium that is you know, possible within you know, regions where you have labor mobility, but not between countries. You know? If you would open the floodgates of you know, migration, you might get much more inequality in the knowledge intense economies, not because knowledge intensity breeds inequality, but maybe because basically all of the people that are poor would move to these knowledge intense economies and basically would broaden those distributions. We also have some evidence that this is a little bit more general, you know. Uh, it's not as extensive as the one before, but like people have looked at products, uh, industries, patents, countries, regions and cities, you know, and we have found, you know, that, you know, uh, basically these measures of knowledge intensity work there as well. Now let's look at the new stuff, because all of the stuff that I showed you was stuff like basically ending 2012, 2013 maybe. You know? So what we're going to do now is look at, at, a, at, a, at some stuff uh, regarding the geography of knowledge and regarding the strategies that we may have to try to improve knowledge diffusion. You know? And one thing about the geography of knowledge is that the geography of knowledge <coughs> is extremely spiky. Yeah? You know, many people have said that, Richard Frodey had said that, Bill Balant had said that. You know? <laughs> you know? So here you have an example of that. Uh, this is a map of patents in the United States. So the United States patents a lot. But most of the United States doesn't patent at all. All of that patenting activity is very concentrated. Here you have San Jose, Santa Clara, you know, the biggest peak. Then you have San Francisco, LA, New York, Boston, Chicago, Detroit. Up here, you know, very little activity. Down here also very little activity. So knowledge is extremely concentrated, and one way to quantify that concentration of knowledge is by using a scaling laws, like the scaling laws of Betancourt and West. So here you have the number of patents that a city produces as a function of the population. And what you find is that you know, the best fit in log-log scale you know, is a straight line with a power of five-fourths. Okay? So what this tells us is that the number of patents that you produce per capita increase with the city population. Okay? So cities like San Jose are producing way more patents per capita than smaller cities. Yeah? <coughs> now, we can grab that data and we can start disaggregating it because one thing is to patent on computer hardware and software, another thing is to patent on plumbing. Okay? And if we look at the patents on computer hardware and software, well, the slope is even more pronounced. It's even more super linear. <coughs> if you look at plumbing, it's almost linear. Yeah? And we can do that not only for patents, but we can do that for patents, we can do it for papers, we can do it for industries, we can do it for occupations. We can grab all of these different types of economic activities, you know, we can look at the scaling relationships, and we can start splitting those scaling relationships among different activities. And what do we start to find? We start to find, well, that the more knowledge-intense activities, at least intuitively, you know, are the ones that have higher scaling uh, coefficients. So, for example, in science, you know, neuro, uh, sorry, in academia, neuroscience tends to be much more concentrated in large cities than arts and humanities research. Mm -hmm. And then if we look at industries, professional scientific and technical services, they scale much more super linearly than retail trade. You know? Retail trade, of course, has to be distributed in space. Yeah? Then if we look at occupations, computer and mathematical occupations, they get much more also of a high linear scaling. So what we can do is we can use that scaling coefficient as a way to see how concentrated this, sit, this activity is in a few large cities. And if we do that, what we find 
is that you know the more knowledge intense activities are the ones that concentrate more in space now what do we do here to measure that me uh, knowledge intensity we don't use the economic complexity index because on the y-axis we already have a measure of spatial concentration so we want to avoid using the same data for the y-axis and the x-axis <coughs> so we use proxies so for example for patents we say hey how long ago was that technology class introduced so if you are patenting in heating you know, basically, well, people have been patenting in heating since the 1880s. So that's not very knowledge intense. It's not new knowledge. It's like old knowledge, like the alphabet. But at some point, the alphabet was an advantageous piece of knowledge. You know? But then, nowadays, it's common knowledge. Yeah? So heating is kind of like all the knowledge. It's less knowledge intense. You know? Now, computer hardware, semiconductor, communication, biotech are new knowledge. And that new knowledge concentrates more in a few places. Yeah? Then, the same true for scientific fields, in neuroscience, immunology, and microbiology, highly concentrated in space, almost quadratic, you know? Arts and humanities, energy, economics, decision science, less concentrated in space. When it comes to industries, we find similar stuff. Professional scientific services, educational services, finance, you know, information technology, very concentrated in space, retail trade, food, textile, apparel manufacturing, construction, not concentrated in space, Occupations, legal, computer, mathematical, physical and social science, business and financial operations, concentrated in space, installation, food preparation, building and grounds cleaning, not concentrated in space. Okay? So what this tells us is that, well, as economic activities become more knowledge intense, the advantage of cities become larger. You know? And what we're observing now is a great deal of spatial inequality. And this spatial inequality that we're observing must be in part you know, because our economy is becoming more knowledge intense, and as our economy becomes more knowledge intense, well, places like San Francisco, New York, and Shenzhen, you know, have even a bigger advantage over smaller places than when the economy was less knowledge intense. Okay? You know? So, we live in this knowledge economy, you know, and one feature of the knowledge economy is going to be that cities are extremely relevant, and if you think about policy, you have to think about, well, what is your policy to include more people in cities not to try to develop knowledge intensity in every little town, you know? And you can think that even if you look at that from that perspective, there are differences of policies around that in the world. In China, they're building mega cities. In Europe, they're not building mega cities, you know? you know? In the US, they did build mega cities at some point during their history. Now they're kind of like a little bit stuck in that ability to include more people into places like Silicon Valley or places like New York, you know? Uh, so they're, they're not producing 20 million people cities anymore. In China they are, you know, and that might be one of the things that is going to help us understand maybe, you know, differences in fate in the future, because a lot of that knowledge intensity, you know, is going to come from these large agglomerations that are more important in a knowledge intense economy than in a manufacturing economy, and of course much more important than in an agricultural economy. In an agricultural economy, you didn't need, you know, those concentrations that you need today. Now, how do we target activities? How do we optimize knowledge diffusion? You know? So I'm going to change gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about strategy. You know? So uh, I'm going to start by you know, reminding you about the principle of relatedness. This tells us that the probability that you enter an activity increases with the number of related activities present in a location, and it increases a little bit like as a you know, super linear you know, relationship. For now, we're going to forget about empirics, and we're going to abstract this theoretically, you know, and this is a pretty good fit, so we're going to say that the probability that you enter an activity is going to be equal to B, some factor, times the number of related activities to the alpha. And that's going to be our model. And we have two parameters, the B and the alpha, you know, and this allows us to create kind of like a range of different curves, you know. So with the B, we can move up and down, and with the alpha, you know, we can make this from when alpha is equal to zero, there's no collective learning. <coughs> the probability of entering an activity doesn't change with the number of related activities. Or when alpha is equal to 4, you know, basically you need a lot of neighbors to have a decent chance to enter an economic activity. Yeah? So now we have, you know, a little model that we can use to measure the probability that you would, or simulate the probability you would enter an activity. And we're going to think strategically about how this affects how we choose, choose activities. Because we live in a world in which, for instance, we could try to target the low-hanging fruit. You know, this activity here, 100% of its neighbors are active. So the probability that I enter is maximal, yeah? but it's a dead end. It doesn't lead me anywhere. <coughs> Here, I have an activity for which I have very few neighbors that are active. So entering this activity is hard, but it opens a lot of doors. 
So should I go for the low hanging fruit? Or should I run a risk, you know, which a high probability of failure, but that opens new opportunities? When should I do that? So one way to think about this, you know, is to first solve it for a simpler network. Because technically, this is an MP hard problem. Like if you do it for an arbitrary network and you try to simulate all possible things, you cannot do it. Like there's exponential complexity here. You know, there's too many, too many, too many possible options and solutions. So we're going to start with this simpler system. So in this network, you know, we have one central hub and we have nodes on this ring and only one node is active to start with. And so it's this will network. And the nice thing about this wheel network is the following, is that it's very symmetric. You know? So the probability that I would enter each one of these guys on the side is proportional to one third to the alpha. They have three neighbors each, one neighbor is active. The probability that I enter the guy to the center is one over n minus one to the alpha. Yeah? Now, let's target the next guy. Let's imagine we succeed. Now when we do that, the probability of entering the guys on the side continues to be one third to the alpha. And that symmetry is going to help me solve the problem analytically. And the one in the center increased by a predictable and constant factor of 1 over m minus 1 to the alpha. So I went to the guy on the side, the probabilities here remain the same, and this one increased a little bit. So now I have a better chance to go to the guy in the center. So there's only one strategic question. When do I target the central hub? You know? Now, I could keep on going, and one naive strategy would be, you know what? I'm going to always go for the low-hanging fruit, and at some point, Targeting the central hub is going to be as likely as targeting the next node on the periphery. So at that point, of course, I'm going to go for the central guy. Okay? But if I do that, I might be missing an opportunity. <coughs> because there might be a world in which targeting the central activity, even when the probability of success is lower, might be good because you're going to slow down for a little bit, but you're going to catch up later because this guy is going to help you a lot with everyone else. Okay? So what you can do is say, well, Let's be a little bit more strategic, so we can write an equation for the total time it takes you to diffuse to the entire network. Okay? So you have an equation, like how long it takes you to gang up you know, on the hub by doing all of the first nodes. Like then you attack the hub, you know, and then you pick up everyone else, and then you pick the last guy with probability. <coughs> okay? And if you do that equation, you say, you know what, we're going to jump to the hub at time L. And L is an unknown that we're going to solve. So now we take this equation for t, you know, we uh, differentiate it and optimize with respect to L, and we find that this is L star, this is the optimal point at which you should target the hub. Okay? Now, how does L star look like? And it looks like this. You know? So these curves are for different values of alpha. You know? Remember that when alpha was equal to zero, which would be the line on the bottom, there's no collective learning. And at that point, if you target the hub in the beginning, or the end of the process almost doesn't matter. Yeah? The time to activate the total network remains the same. But as alpha becomes larger, you know, as this curve you know, of contagion becomes more nonlinear, you know, basically you start developing a minimum you know, that becomes very pronounced. And it turns out that the optimal time to target the hub is actually before that naive solution. But it's not very much in the beginning. So if you try to target the hub too early, if you try to go to this unrelated and sophisticated activity too early, well, you're going to have a lot of failed attempts, you know, and you're going to take a long time to activate that activity, and that waste of time, you're not going to be able to catch up later in the process. You know? But also, if you wait too much to try to activate that central activity, basically you're going to have wasted an opportunity. So you have like this window of opportunity in which it's optimal to target this unrelated, unconnected activity. Okay? Now that's true for this little wheel network. So then, you know, we have to continue working on this paper to generalize this. So we generalize it for like a generalized wheel network, the math gets a little bit more complicated. Then we do it for a scale free network, we have to do simulations, but the story more or less like is the same. You have to target hubs at an intermediate level of development. So here we compare, you know, for the product space and for the research space, you know. What is the optimal strategy with the strategy that we observe countries have been playing? You know? So here you have the level of diversification of a country, and here we see what is the degree in the product space of the nodes that countries at that level of diversification were activating. You know? 
and the blue line is the optimal, okay? So the optimal way to do this would be at the beginning, you know, be very shy, just target only related things, you know, but as you diversify here, you know, you should run risk, and then at the end, the low-hanging fruit also is the best fruit, so then you don't need to do that anymore. So this is what the theory says. The data, you know, on average is the red, so it says countries, you know, are not that stupid. At least they get the curvature right, you know, yeah, compared to the model. They're, they're not that naive, you know, but they tend to be a little bit over-optimistic in the beginning, you know, and they tend to be a little bit too conservative in the intermediate level of development, yeah? Mm -hmm. So when they would hit this level of development, countries, you know, at this level of development, which a lot of like middle-income countries <coughs> should be actually, you know, uh, taking bigger risks, going to activities that are more sophisticated, and, you know, more connected. In the research space, you know, the evidence is weaker, but, you know, uh, qualitatively is similar. Now, how does knowledge actually move between activities and between locations, you know? So we talk a lot about knowledge, you know, but we talk about knowledge in a very abstract way, you know? But knowledge must exist somewhere, you know, and it must move through some sort of mechanisms that might go beyond just, you know, reading or watching the internet. Actually, you know, reading and watching the internet is really bad for knowledge diffusion. You know, there's very little knowledge that you can diffuse with that. You know, because actually knowledge requires, you know, like people, experience, practice, and a social context. So to study the movement of knowledge, what we did is we leveraged a data set, you know, that we used to create an integrated data visualization resource for Brazil called Data Viva. And this data set summarized the entire work history of a country. So for all of Brazil, for everybody that worked on the uh, uh, formal sector economy, <coughs> we knew exactly, you know, what job they were doing, in which company, okay, which industry that company was operating, we knew also which location that company was in, we knew their salary, their age, their when, gender, the general occupation support. We have all of those labor flows, you know. So what we could do with those labor flows is reconstruct, you know, the knowledge history of a worker. Because one way of knowing what you know is knowing what you did. So I'm going to say that, hey, if you have been working 10 years as a nurse in a hospital, you know how to be a nurse and you know about hospitals. And you don't know how to be a race car driver in Formula One. That would be a different industry and a different occupation. Yeah? So basically, the way to measure knowledge here, the trick, is to use work history as a way to measure knowledge. So this is inspired on the work that you know, Ron and Frank had been doing. You know? And now I can use this to measure the knowledge history of a worker. The novelty here is that we can actually look you know, at the entry events of firms you know, and we can separate between different knowledge channels. So we look at two types of firms. We look at new firms, you know, but also we look at pioneer firms. <laughs> and pioneer firms are interesting, why? Because these are the first firms to operate in an industry that was not present in a location. So let's imagine that in Utrecht, there has never been, you know, a company in the space of virtual reality. And there's the first one now that appears, okay? So now, this is a diversification event. But now I'm seeing the atom of diversification. I'm not seeing diversification in this like, big administrative data set of employment by regions. No, I say this is the firm that is the first one to enter, and this is exactly who they hired. Okay? And I can see where these people used to work. So since I know where these people used to work, I can start measuring the knowledge that they brought in. Because people are kind of like these bees that are bringing in the honey, but every honey has a different flavor. Okay? So some people might come from the same industry and occupation. Okay? So they moved and they brought industry-specific knowledge and occupation-specific knowledge. Some people come from the same industry but change occupation. You know? Some people change industry but kept the same occupation. And some people change both industries and occupation. Now, of course, this is not just a two-by-two two matrix. We can use the idea of relatedness to make this a continuum. And when we make this a continuum, this is what we find. You know, so who are the people that these pioneer companies hire? You know? well, and they tend not to hire people with industry-related knowledge. Okay? So they hire people mainly with industry-unrelated knowledge, and here they hire people with occupation-related knowledge, and also basically anybody that they can find. Okay? <laughs> now, these are the decisions that are being made, or the options that are being taken. Now, what are the right decisions? And what's the basic thing that you want in a company. What's the first measure of success? Survival. 
You know, that's the first measure of success, you know, survival. So which are the companies that survive? Because not every new business that starts, you know, survives. You know? And the companies that survive are these ones. You see, it's almost the opposite. You see, like the yin and the yang. You know? <laughs> the ones that survive are the ones that hire people with industry-related knowledge. You know? And it, the occupation-related knowledge doesn't appear to matter much once you have industry-related knowledge. So we do this with OLS here, you know. So basically what we're doing here is separating knowledge into three channels. We say, okay, do you have, the workers, do they bring industry-related knowledge? Do they bring occupation-related knowledge? Do they bring location-related knowledge? Did they work in the same place or did they work in a different place? These are the three channels. Industry, occupation, local knowledge. Then we also have years of schooling, which is a traditional human capital measure, sizes and wages, you know, industry fixed effects, region fixed effects, years fixed effects. The only thing that really goes to the dance here is the industry-specific knowledge is the one that best explains the survival of these pioneer firms, you know, and after that, you know, is the local knowledge for the survival, not for the growth, okay? You know? So that's, you know, the main finding, you know, if we do industries that are not, firms that are not pioneers, you know, we find something similar, their occupation-specific knowledge matters a little bit, but it's still industry-specific knowledge is the queen of the ball, you know? Uh, now, is this just a correlation or is this causal, okay? So here we use an IV treatment also to uh, be able to trace causality. What we do is something known as a Bartic instrument. I, have you guys ever heard of a Bartic instrument? Don't feel bad if you have because I haven't heard about it also like two years ago, so don't worry. <laughs> so like what you do is, you know, you have a country and a country is big. You know, this is Brazil, you know? So Brazil would be like kind of like, I don't know, from like Poland to Portugal, you know, or maybe more. You know? So it's a big country, you know? It has a lot of regions, some regions are rich, some regions are poor and so forth, you know? And it has a lot of people, it's like 180 million people in the, in the economy. So what you can do is you can take national level fluctuations as exogenous shocks at the local level, yeah? So let's say in Brazil, there is a national level fluctuation, you know, on the price of oil, okay? So the price of oil goes down so the companies that hire people that work on the oil industry fire people. So now all of the companies that work in industries that are related to oil have an excess supply of workers with related knowledge. Yeah? You know, at the local level. Yeah? So there's national level fluctuation. We say it produces a local level shock. You know? And you can use that you know, to create these shocks and to create an IV. And we find also that industry specific knowledge you know, is the one that gets confirmed using this type of IV treatment. Now, the last part here, uh, before I move to the applied work, is how is complexity related to knowledge diffusion? You know? So we looked a lot about different types of knowledge and how it moves, you know? uh, but is it harder to move bigger chunks of knowledge? Okay? So if I want to learn something more difficult, do I need more social reinforcement? Do I need more neighbors? Let's say I'm trying to learn, you know, like how to play, like if we go back to the music example, just like a little flute, or I'm trying to learn, you know, how to play, you know, the violin. Do I need more social reinforcement and classes and, and people with knowledge when I'm trying to learn the violin than when I'm trying to learn how to, you know, blow a whistle, you know? So when the knowledge is bigger, it's harder to move. To answer that question, we looked at data from GitHub. Are you guys all familiar with GitHub? Yeah? Okay, so GitHub is a platform, you know, where coders can, you know, merge and integrate, you know, their code. This is Alex Simoes, the creator of the OEC, you know, and Alex, you know, contributes to GitHub a lot. He does a lot of, you know, work there, you know, but also, you know, he does work together with other people. So in GitHub, I can measure Alex's <coughs> contributions to <coughs> projects. I can see if he submitted a piece of code in JavaScript or Python or Ruby or whatnot, and I can see who else contributed to the same repositories so I can reconstruct <laughs> his social network too, or his professional coding network, yeah? And what I can do is I can measure this like principle of relatedness of these relatedness curves, you know, for different languages, okay? And the hypothesis here would be that, well, languages that are more difficult, if they require more social reinforcement, I'm gonna have, you know, a more pronounced, you know, principle of relatedness of a, or a more collective learning type of curve. So let's start to look at the data. So if you look at plain text and HTML, I find no evidence of collective learning. Okay? So I look at the probability that a programmer 
commits a piece of code in plain text as a function of the number of friends that committed code on that language and the curve is completely flat that tells us that these guys probably knew how to write in English before getting into GitHub. Okay? <laughs> now, if I look at HTML, I see a little bit of slope, but almost nothing. You know? So basically, we tell that hey, HTML might be one of those things that you can learn alone. You don't need that much social reinforcement, you know, because the priority that you commit for the first time in HTML, if you have 10 friends or you have 100 friends that have committed in HTML, is the same. Now, let's look at Python and JavaScript. Okay? And here you start observing, you know, these diffusion curves. You know? So Python, yes, you do have like a baseline probability to start contributing by yourself, but the more coders you have, the more likely that there are your colleagues, the more likely you start committing. The same for JavaScript. Now we go into Ruby and PHP, you know, even more. And now we go into Java and Go, and we'll serve even a more pronounced curve. Now, we're going to use this parameter alpha, which is the feed of the logistic curve, you know, as a way to measure how much social reinforcement you need, you know. So in the case of HTML, alpha was like around zero. Here, alpha is around 0 0.1, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to compare those alpha <coughs> parameters with an independent survey, you know, of how difficult it is to program in a computer language that, you know, was published in the literature that interviewed around 900 different developers. And what we find is the following, is that this is how difficult, you know, basically a language is, you know, so one means easy, you know, seven would be the most difficult language to learn according to developers, you know, and this is, you know, how nonlinear that relationship is, how much you need social reinforcement. If it wasn't for Ruby, the relationship would be perfect. Okay? You know? So apparently, yes, the more difficult it is to learn something, you know, the more social reinforcement you might need. The last part before I move to apply work is about subsidies, you know? So we're talking a little bit about strategy, and when are subsidies more effective? You know? And here there's like two papers that I want to call your attention to. The first one is by people, you know, here like Pierre and um, also Wolf Ulbach, you know? And basically what they did here is they look at the probability that an EU region would start patenting in a technology class as a function of how related, you know, that region was to that technology class. But they separated between regions that had received a subsidy and the ones that had not received a subsidy. And the ones that received a subsidy you know, had a higher probability of entry than the ones that didn't receive the subsidy, but that probability was significantly higher at the intermediate level of relatedness. Why? Because, well, when you are very unrelated, no matter how much money you throw into the problem, you don't lift that probability in a significant way. You know? Also, when you have a very related activity, you don't need the subsidy anymore, because you already have what it takes to enter that activity. Yeah? So at this intermediate level of relatedness, we find an effect. You know? So, uh, inspired by this idea, we also you know, started looking at this in the context of industrial parks in China. Because China has thousands of industrial parks, you know? And here we look at the probability that a city would become successful at an industry, would increase its output significantly, you know, as a function of how related that industry was to a city and where that industry had been prioritized in the city's industrial parks or not. And when the level of relatedness is low, you know, there's no effect. At this intermediate level, the effect is significant. At high relatedness, there's no effect anymore, it's the same story, okay? So in some sense, the subsidies are more effective at this intermediate level of relatedness. If you are too ambitious, you know, you're wasting money, and if you basically are targeting things that the market will be able to solve, you're gonna be wasting money as well. Is that this intermediate level of relatedness that we find the biggest effect of the policy. Now I'm gonna switch gears, and I'm gonna go to the applied work, okay? So I'm gonna step away, you know, from theories on, on collective learning, and I'm going to show you work in which we have been building tools to integrate, distribute, and visualize data at large scale. And this is not a scientific problem, this is an engineering problem. Okay? So the problem that we're trying to solve here you know, is the following. It is that to inform decisions, public and private sector organizations need to integrate and deal with multiple streams of data. But working with these multiple streams of data is extremely costly. Okay? 
So what we need is a technical solution that integrates, distributes, visualizes, and helps you analyze that data at a lower cost. It's an engineering solution. You, know? you are a government, for instance, and you have multiple ministries, and you have multiple departments in your ministry, so you have transportation department, health department, the economy has a customs union, and labor, you know, data in the social security administration, and there's income data in the tax authority, there's demographic data in the census and the civil registry and so forth. You know? And you have a challenge to integrate the data, a challenge to distribute that data, to analyze that data, and maybe even to start automating decisions using the data directly to create signals. Now, what is the state of the art in this? And the state of the art at this moment, when it comes to public data, is <laughs> filled with good intentions. Yeah? <laughs> uh, so let's look at a few examples. So you go to like Argentina Open Data site, you search for, let's say, income data, you know, and what you find is like a few, you know, like files there, you know, you download one of them. You know, and what you're going to get is like a few numbers in an Excel spreadsheet. You know, it's not integrated, not very great. So you say, well, but that's Argentina. You know, so let's go, you know, to the U.S. So you go to the U.S., you know, you search for income data, you know, there. And basically, you know, you find a very similar experience. You find like some sort of file that you're going to download, a little numbers. <laughs> so you say, well, you know, let's go to the Swiss, they're techno libertarians. You know, so, <laughs> so let's go to the Swiss, you know, and you go to their open data site, you search data for the city of Zurich, you know, you find value added by industry, you know, you find a file, you open it, and the experience is not that much better. Okay? So I'm going to say that we have failed. We have failed to integrate data, we have failed to distribute, analyze, ultimately. And the reason why we fail is because we have the wrong paradigm. Okay? So we have been thinking of data as files. You know? So basically, you guys say, hey, what's the data? Well, it's a number inside a spreadsheet, inside a, a spreadsheet is a file. So what do we do? We do websites that distribute files. You know? So they do this type of architecture, there's a user, there's a website, there's files, okay, we open the data. You know? But in reality, well, data point is not a number that lives in a spreadsheet. That's some sort of anecdote of our current technology. You know? uh, data point is something that we use as an element in a story. You know? Something we use to make a comparison, to prove a point, to signal the tension into a certain issue. So what we need to do is not tools that distribute files, but tools that transform data into stories. Because when we transform data into stories, we integrate data. Okay? So when I read a book, the book has multiple data sources that might have informed that narrative, but that narrative you know, clearly integrates all of those data sources. You know, some numbers come from here, some numbers come from there, in the narrative that integrate. So if we change the paradigm, we're going to change our architecture. You know? But basically, we're going to go to a world in which we integrate that data, and we're going to extract entities that are common across the data. So let's say I grab European data, okay? So I grab European data, and one entity that exists in that data set might be cities or NATS3 regions, okay? And that NATS3 regions are going to be used in health data, and they're going to be available on income data, they're going to be available on trade data, so they're entities that are common. But other entities can be like products, or they could be industries, occupations, majors, universities, and so forth. And those entities are going to be associated variables that are expressed in different data sets. Okay? So if you go to the current type of distribution platforms, you have to find a city in each one of the data sets to each one of the variables so it's not integrated. But by finding the entities and finding all of the variables describing each one of the entities, I can create integrated stories that grab all of the data for each one of the entities and they put it all in one place, no matter where it's coming from. Okay? It's a lot of engineering that you have to do to get this to work. But you get a couple of bonuses. The first bonus that you get is that by grabbing the data and putting it in this type of um, structure, you transform data into thousands of stories that now are search engine optimized. Okay? So what we're doing is search engine optimizing the data. Why? Because Google has no way of knowing that cell B3 of an Excel sheet tells us the median household income of Utrecht. But if I give it a sentence that says, the minimum household income of Utrecht is, I don't know, 45,000 euros a year, well, now they can know because Google is a very semantic type of engine. Yeah? So I transformed the data into story and I created you know, a page for each one of these locations you know, that integrates all of that information. So I SEO the data, now people can find the data you know, through the web. You know? The other thing that I've done 
is that by integrating all of the data, I have created a backend that can provide data services for a future in which I want to use AI to start making recommendations and decisions because remember that AI is not about algorithms. It's about training algorithms with data. And the quality of your AI is as much dependent on the data than on the algorithm. I would say it's more dependent on the quality of the data than on your algorithm because a simple regression with good data gives you better AI than a sophisticated deep learning with bad data. Okay? So you need to have ways to have all of this data piped into you know, uh, this new technology that we're going to have in the future. So think about like the, the power plant of the fourth industrial revolution. You know, when we invented electricity, well, people wanted to have a refrigerator at home and they needed some place to plug that refrigerator to the power plant that was down the street. Well, in the world of AI, you know, the AI is going to be the refrigerator, but at some point we need to plug that AI into the data. You know, and you need to create these plugs. So basically by integrating the data and creating these tools, we're helping create these first plugs. Now, how do these tools look like? You know? So if you go to Google and you search for the exports of Netherlands or Canada or any country, you know, the first link that you get in organic search is a link to the Observatory of Economic Complexity. This is a tool that transforms the world's international trade data uh, into interactive stories you know, that allow you to start digging deeper and actually observing you know, bilateral trade, observing the uh, uh, opportunities of countries and so forth. You know, this is a tool that makes more than 20 million interactive visualizations. You could never do this on print. Okay? And you know, it's a tool that also is quite old by now. You know, the OEC uh, turned seven years old in, in November or October this year. You know? So it's a tool from 2011. It's also a very simple tool in the sense that it only focuses on one data set. This is international trade data. You know? But since then, we've actually increased our capacity to create these tools. So um, in 2013, we created DataViva, data integrated data for all of Brazil. This is data on trade, but also on industries, occupations, and educations. This is data for more than 50 million people at a subnational level. Brazil has more than 5,000 municipalities. That's way more than the 200 countries that are in the world. You know? So basically, we created a more ambitious resource. On 2016, we created Data USA, and Data USA started to move away a little bit from being only about economic data. Okay? But we started to discover that a lot of the value here was not just you know, on the economic data, but also on creating tools that transform data into stories. So it includes also uh, household data, living data, health data, education data, and so forth. You know? It's a very ambitious project you know, that integrates data for more than 10 US government departments. In 2017, we created Data Africa. This is the first project that we were able to create that was a transnational. So it integrates data from 13 African countries, also at a subnational level. It also, I like, uh, one thing that I like about Data Africa, that it shows you that a lot of like these bad websites that we have there, it's not a matter of money or about place. Because we can make a site for 13 countries of Africa that is better than the site for Switzerland. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's not about the money. You know? It's really about knowing what technology to build you know, and how to build it. You know, here we have Jobs KSA. This is a tool that we created for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It integrates data for the entire pension fund system to create detailed indicators of all of the uh, economy of Saudi Arabia. So it's a uh, indicators for industries, occupations, employment, labor, uh, for uh, all of the kingdom at a subnational resolution. So this also is individual level data similar to the one that we use in Data Viva. On 2018, we also created Data Chile. Data Chile integrates data from more than 15 different government departments. You know, it includes trade data, but also it includes you know, uh, demographic data, election data, health data, education data, and so forth. You know? Does this idea work? Does this idea of transforming data into stories to search engine optimized data work, or is it just a hypothesis? So here you see the traffic to the OEC from the moment that we launched it in 2011 until today. And you see how the traffic grows over time. You know, it goes down during the summer vacations and during Christmas. You know? Yeah? You know? But now we have about half a million you know, monthly organic users that come to the site. Is this just a fluke? Did we get lucky with the OEC? Or did we discover a way of doing this that was reproducible? So here you have Data USA. So Data USA was launched in April 2016. And it was hugely popular on the press. We were in the New York Times, where the most shared news on the Atlantic. People were like tweeting for like three or four days. This is fantastic, all this stuff. But that traffic comes and goes. 
you cannot live from social media or referral traffic. Is you know, like for 15 minutes of fame? Yes. You know, but if you want to create a sustainable resource, you need to have a sustainable source of traffic. And over time, traffic grows. This is as of April of this year. Now we are like around there. You know, uh, and now we have more traffic every month. You know, than the one that we had at the moment that we launched. And this is better traffic because it's not people bumping into an uh, an article. You know, in social media or in the New York Times. These are people that are searching for data that they need and they're finding it in the resource. You know? And this also started to affect the way that open data efforts occur around the world. So this is the US Census site nowadays. This is data USA in 2016. And this is the site that the US Census is planning to do in the future. This is for the third Trump administration. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like basically they're completely imitating Data USA, they're just copying it and we take that as a measure of impact. I'm also now an advisor of the government of Korea, they're going to release Data Korea later this month, maybe early on January. You know, they grabbed the Data USA code base, they did a very good job at adapting it to Korean data. You know, they invited me to be an advisor, you know, and oversee the project and they're going to be Data Korea. India is starting a similar project too, you know? So they, they like actually were contacted by the people of India too, that they're gonna do like a data India following this new paradigm that we created for open data distribution. Maybe one day there will be data Europe, who knows? Huh? So that's something that we're gonna try to get to do as well. So with that, we win the integration challenge, but there's still lots of challenges ahead. So what I'm gonna do is show you features and tools that we created to try to solve these other challenges. Because Data USA very nicely integrates the data for the entire country, but at the same time, the data is kind of like trapped in these little profits or something like that. So you might want to be able to distribute and bulk download, you know, combinations of this data. <coughs> so for that, we created another feature that is called the card. So you go to Data USA and you find the data that you want. Oh shit, this is like overcast completely. Yeah, because like there you can see that you go to Add to Card. You see, it's going, it's going to Add to Card. Yeah. I'm sorry about that, guys. It has been overcast all the time? No? no, no. no? no. Just, just this one. <laughs> yeah, you can see now. It's a different graph. Yeah. No, oh. yeah, this one is overcast. Yeah. Yeah. Do you mind if I do a, a little trick? <laughs> okay, there. Okay. So there, you know, you find a data, for example, median age, you want to integrate it with other data sets, you add it to cart. So this data set comes be coming from many different departments. Come from the American Community Survey, from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the County Health Rankings. It doesn't matter as long as it's available in Data USA and it matches in geography or industries or occupation or some sort of entity, we can match it. You not only can get the data from the map, you can go to a profile. For instance, here we go to the Cook County, Illinois profile. You know, and we're going to look on data on you know insurance coverage and diseases. You know, we also add it to the card. You know. And once you add that data to the card, you know, you know, what you get is all of the data nicely merged and matched for you. You don't have to write that Python script to merge that data, okay? You just select the data that you want, you take it with you, okay? So this is huge value. And like when we release this, we're saying like, well, this looks like a bit of a technical feature. Will people use it? It's more popular than the map, you know? <laughs> so it's that big of a feature. And also, it's an enabling technology because it's gonna help us solve later the analytical challenge. Because with the card, we solve the distribution challenge. Now any user without any knowledge of programming can go and say, I want this, 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 this. They go shopping, boom, they get the data. <laughs> but for the analytical challenge, you know, we need a tool that allows you to create custom analysis. You know? So for that, we get a tool called Dive that allows you to transform any data set into story. You know? So you grab, you know, like a data set, you basically select some of the uh, visualizations that it recommends you. Now we're doing these recommendations by AI. You can do multivariate regressions and you can write a story. Okay? So we wanted to know if dive made a difference. You know? And if it helped people uh, learn better. So we did a randomized experiment with 70 subjects from Deloitte and BCG. These are two big consulting companies in the US. You know? And we did a, a study to try to understand if their ability to come up with conclusions or the right conclusions uh, from a data set change as we change the tools that they had at hand. You know? So we gave all of these people a data set with the salaries, experience and accomplishment of a thousand professors in a hypothetical university. Okay? 
So we'll say professor something something makes this amount of money, the works in this department, is you know an assistant professor and has this number of publications, the number of citations, the number of years of experience and so forth. And they knew that this data set was hypothetical, you know, there was no deception. You know? But before they could look at the data, we asked them a series of questions. So they could tell us which were the priors about what they're gonna find in the data. Now, have any of you ever done psychological experiments before? Because one condition of running a psychological experiment is that the subject doesn't have to know what part of the experiment is the experiment. You know? There's a little bit, it has to be kind of like a little bit of a trick or deception in that context, you know? So we asked them, you know, what they expected to see on the data set. We asked them for many things. And one of the things that we asked them is, did they expect it to serve a gender wage gap in the data set? And what do you think they say? Did they expect a gender wage gap in this salary data set? Yes. yes? And did they expect that gender wage gap to favor men or women? Men. men. So they expected a gender wage gap that favored men 90% of the day. You know? So of course, we prepare a hypothetical university that had a gender wage gap that favored women. You know? So now, 90% of them were wrong in their hypothesis, and at the end of the exercise, they have to tell us what the data said. You know? But of course, determining a gender wage gap is not that easy because you have to control for a bunch of factors. You know? It's not just comparing hours, but it could be like all of the women are younger than the guys. You know? So you have to control for age, for experience, for all of these other things. So then, they did an exercise, but we assigned them randomly to do the exercise using Excel or using Dive. You know? So all else equal, we randomized the guys. You know, randomized the tool that the people used. And we asked them, did the data confirm or reject the hypothesis? Reject was the right answer. And when they used Excel, 57% of the users got to the right answer. Now, these are not students. These are professional data scientists from two of the biggest consulting companies in the world. And, you know, they charge pretty penny for analyzing your data. Of course, they were not doing this for a client. They knew that they were doing an experiment and helping out in a university project, but anyway. But when they used Dive, 80% of them were correct, okay? So just by changing the tool that they had in their hands, we changed the probability that they got to the, wrong, to the right posterior, starting from the wrong prior. So now, what's the pipeline that we're building? So imagine, you know, you are here in college, and your professor says, you know what, you know, here in the urban planning department, we're interested in the correlation between, you know, uh, commuting alone and obesity. Can you run a regression to see if there's something there? You know? Well, if you had to do that, you know, it would be a lot of effort because you have to integrate data from multiple sources to be able to get there. So, if you have the pipeline that we have been designing, if you have data USA and Dive, how long would it take you to do this? So, sorry, sorry, let me make the trick. Yeah. So you would go to Data USA and you would start grabbing, you know, a different data sets. So you have obesity data, you add it to the card. Now, homeowners, data, commuting alone data, you add it to the card. So those are the two data sets of interest. Let's put some controls. Average travel time, we want to do commuting alone, controlling for how long it takes you to travel. We add it to the card, you know. Then, you know, we're going to take here a median household income to have a measure of income because income can be correlated with obesity to add it to the card. Then we have all of our data in the card, nicely integrated, so fine, so good. So now we download it and we bring it into Dive. In the future, this is going to be integrated into Data USA, you know. And then you go immediately to the regression tool, you select your dependent variable, obesity. You're going to control for obesity on the previous year. You know, you're going to put commute time data and everything, and you get to your regression table. Okay? So you can do on 45 seconds, you know, like, what it would take you maybe like a week. Okay? So it's, you know, technology and productivity, the A, you know. <laughs> well, you're killing jobs, huh? Huh? You're killing jobs. You might create jobs, yes. Yeah, because that might hire people in the future. Is that right? You're killing our jobs. No, no. Like, is, is there jobs to clean data? That's the part, yeah. That's the part of the job you want to automate. Yeah? And now you see, for example, that obesity, you know, uh, even controlling for obesity on the previous year, you know, increases with driving alone to work, controlling for the other factors, you know. Don't take this, you know, as, as a study of the public health or commuting alone, but take this as an illustration of a technological pipeline. And the reason why we're doing this technological pipeline is because automation is something that is coming for real, you know, but it's coming mostly so far in the private sector, in manufacturing, in transportation. This is a factory in Toshiba that manufactures solid-state drives. The factory has no humans inside. The entire factory is a robot. 
Okay? You know? So don't complain about me about kill job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here you have the self-driving car from Google. It's a very famous, very popular example, that of the self-driving car. You know? But actually, it's an example that it's, it's a little bit artificial because you don't see too many self-driving cars on the street, but for over 10 years you have had self-driving mining trucks operating in mines of, in Australia, in mines in Chile. You know, these are the real deal. These mines, you see, they don't even have a cabin. You know? And what we have been doing, you know, is actually, you know, uh, doing also technologies that are helping us bring automation also to the public sector. Okay? So this is a tool that we have been building with the federal government of Argentina and the uh, Inter-American Development Bank. And what this tool does, you know, is help, you know, uh, people in the cabinet of ministries to identify physical gaps so they can optimize public investment. So each one of these dots is a census population of Argentina. Okay? You know? And, you know, uh, each one of the blue circles is the location of a hospital. So we know where all of the population of Argentina is, we know where all of the hospitals are, we know the capacity of the hospitals, and based on that we calculate an index that tells us how much access each population has to each one of these public health services. And that helps us determine the gap in public investment that exists for each population and which are the populations that have that gap. I don't know if you know how the public investment in such is really made all over the world, but you have money, you know, that the government needs to invest. Some of them goes into public investment. And the way that they do it, since public investment doesn't respond to like price incentives, like you have people that are in a poor neighborhood, have bad health services, it's not that doctors are being paid more there, and that's how you know, okay? You know, basically you need data to figure that out. So what they do is they run household service, and they use those household service data to try to measure those gaps. Those household service, they have low frequency, low spatial resolution sometimes, you know, they, they're full of other biases and mistakes because when they know your door, to run like a survey that's going to take like seven hours, because that's sometimes like how long those surveys are, you know, there's not a lot of participation. So what we're trying to do is to grab data that is administrative to try to kind of like find those gaps, you know, and be able to determine where public investment is needed. Now, you can see from here that the next step of the project, you know, that we're talking right now for the next contract is quite obvious. The next step of the project is, can we use now AI to suggest which are the locations in which we should build new hospitals or which hospitals we should expand in their capacity to minimize, you know, this deprivation, these gaps, you know. And now you start seeing how, like, you can start using this big data, you know, and AI, you know, to work in uh, really, you know, public sector decisions. So now my last slide, and I promise this is the last slide, mm -hmm. you know, is to reflect a little bit on this, you know. So there's this great paper that came out a couple of years ago that uh, starts asking questions about the morals of AI, you know, that was done by a group of people at Brown, you know. And basically they grabbed, you know, the trolley problem, which is a very famous moral dilemma, you know, and they found yet another fantastic twist on it. You know? So what it is, you have a trolley that is, you know, going down the street and it's going to run over these five people. And you can pull the lever and deviate the trolley, but in this other track there's one person, so basically you would be save five and kill one. You know? And what they did this is they run the full trolley problem, they say, okay, this is what, you know, the trolley, this is what the person did, so either pull the lever or didn't pull the lever, you know, would you blame that person? So they tried to see how much people would blame, you know, people that would pull the lever or wouldn't pull the lever. But the thing is, there was not only people pulling or not pulling the lever, they also got an AI to pull the lever or not pull the lever. And what they find, you know, is that people got blamed by the action. So if you are there and you pull the lever and you deviate the trolley and you kill one to save five, you are kind of morally wrong. But if you are an AI, they blame you for not pulling the lever. If you don't pull the lever wrong. And this shows you that holding all else equal, the way that we're morally judging the same action performed by a machine and the same action performed by a human is different. You know? So that's also where a lot of my research agenda is going next. So with a couple of social psychologists and roboticists, we actually created like a large questionnaire with more than 50 of these type of questions that we're going to be running to try to test you know, and understand how people perceive 
you know, actions performed by AI vis-a-vis -vis humans for a large number of moral dimensions and a large number of different situations, you know, because I think that's also one of the things that, you know, now we should be working on. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your patience and happy to take any questions.